Grande. San Diego Police calling all cars, attention all cars. Broadcast 172. Be on the lookout for two men described as soldiers. Last seen driving Dodge Touring Car. One man has a deep voice. Thought to be heading for Mexican border. These men are killers. That's all. <laughs> Yeah. Well, wait, wait till I tap this wire 
and see if I can get through a, a line into police headquarters. Acting upon this information, Chief Hayes of the San Diego Police Department immediately sends Detective Lieutenant Terry Kelly and James Patrick to the scene. Accompanied by Chief of Police S.P. McMullen and Captain of Detective Joseph Myers, the men make a search. From the body, they remove several letters in the wallet, which establishes the victim's identity as being one Frank McCrary, a San Diego taxi driver. Tire marks show where a car has been driven off the road. Stop, turned around, headed back on the highway, going east. And slim as this leads seems, Myers and Kirk decide to call the track. Others finish the investigation of the murder scene, then return to headquarters. The first move is to check on McCrary's actions as far as possible, and accordingly, Sergeant Joseph Lopez is assigned the task. His initial step is to interrogate a cab driver friend of McCrary. Is your name registered? Yeah, but if you're a salesman, you're wasting your time. I'm very sorry. Now, wait just a minute. I'm sorry that you're busy, but I'll have to take some of your time. I would be interested in anything. Say, wait a minute, will you? I'm from the police. Detective Lopez, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, are you sure you have the right place? I'm sure I didn't do nothing. Well, just calm down for a minute. I'll tell you what I want. I want to ask you some questions about Frank McCrary. You know him? Frank McCrary? Oh, yes, I know Frank McCrary. Has he gotten into trouble? I didn't think he ever did anything wrong. Well, McCrary was killed last night. Killed? Yeah. Did his family know about it? They live right down the street. I thought everybody liked him. Who no, did wait it? just a minute, will you? We don't know who did it. It was found out on the road to Lemon Grove with a bullet hole in his head. But it seems funny to me that anyone... Dead. Um, everybody likes him. Now, look, him. do you keep your cab near McCrary's? Yeah, but I assure you, I didn't see nobody who did it. We all like McCrary. Yeah, well, did you see him last night? No, I was busy driving a couple of soldiers. Uh, say, wait a minute. Where did you say they found McCrary? Up on the road to Lemon Grove. He was just off the side with some grass and weeds. The road to Lemon Grove? Lemon Grove? Yeah. What's the sudden brown study about? I'm just thinking about them soldiers. Are... And about Frank being found on that now, same look, road. Look, Mr. Register, if you've got something to tell me, how about coming out of it a minute and talking? Well, I got a couple of soldiers uh, out that way last night, you see. About halfway to Lemon Grove, they got on my nerves, and I pulled a gag and brought them back. They both had blue cap cords. What, the cap cords got to do with it? Oh, I don't know. Only I just happen to remember them, that's all. I see. Well, look, suppose you tell me just what these two soldiers did from the time you picked them up on. Can you do that? Well, I didn't have stuff until late because my wife's been sick. She had an operation. Uh, I guess I need to take No, no, don't bother. Just uh, tell me what the soldiers yes, did if you want. Yeah, well, well, they came up and asked me to take them to Lemon Grove, you see. And I said, sure, boys, jump in and start it out. After a while, one of them leaned over in the seat and began to ask questions about the car. I guess he'd never driven a car and wanted to learn, you see. And I told him I'd teach him for $5. I've had quite a few people want to learn, you know. I think everybody should learn to drive a car, don't yes, you? Yes, I do. Now, what did the soldiers do? Oh, uh, well, this guy wanted to know all about the gear shifts and stuff, and I answered his question for a while. But when we got to National City, I, he told me to take a shortcut down the road, see? And I knew there wasn't a shortcut, and I got suspicious, and I stalled my motor. I stalled my motor, you see? And I just pulled the choke out and stalled. <laughs> they didn't even catch on. I guess they're pretty dumb about cars, all right. I think they'd have seen for out the joke, wouldn't you? Yes, yes. Then what happened? Well, I was scared. Oh, I was scared, but I didn't let them know, see? I, didn't let them... I told them that I had engine trouble. I said, I guess we better go back, boys. And they didn't uh, say anything, so I turned around and come back. Well, uh, when we got within the city limits, they said they wanted to get out, and I said, oh, heck, boys, I'll take you right back where I picked you up. I won't charge you anything, even though you think what you don't get. They wouldn't hear of it, so I left them out the edge of the city. They said they take the streetcar and the rest of the way. Well, I was willing to drive them back downtown, because I had to go there anyway, but <laughs> yeah, they just got out. Well, do you think you could identify them if you saw them again? Well, do you think they're the ones who did it? You're right, you know, and they're both young. But they didn't look like they'd do anything like that. You know, I was a little suspicious at the times. I didn't think they'd kill nobody. If I'd thought that, you know what I'd done? I'd call the police. That's what. They were young. And they said, let's see now, they said they were from that 157th Infantry. That's it. Oh, I've seen worse looking men. Oh, well, I'll wait just a minute, Mr. Register. Isn't there anything special you can remember about them? Well, let me see. Of course, I didn't see him much, you know, because in the back seat, only one of them, not just one of them talked. He was the oldest one I came. He said, oh, his low voice had an awful low voice. Say, there's Matt. He knows McCrary. Do you want to talk to him? I'll call him over to you. Yeah, yeah, I'll call him. Hey, Matt! Matt! Yeah. Come here! I, I don't think he knows anything about it. He's a pretty good friend of McCrary's. Come here, Matt. Hurry. Paul McCrary. I didn't think nobody would want to hurt him. Hello, Matt. Say, McCrary was killed last night. This is a detective. I was telling about how everybody liked McCrary. McCrary killed? Well, I was just talking to him last night. Why, well, that's awful. You saw him last night? Well, yeah. We said they signed off for a while. What sort of a car did McCrary drive? A, a Dodge. Dodge touring car. Well, now, did you happen to see two soldiers around while you were there? Yeah. He came up and hired your car while I was talking to him. You know who did it? No, no. We are trying to find out. Well, you tell me what these soldiers did. Well, like I said, we were standing there, and they came up and asked Frank how long it would take to drive over to Lemon Grove, and he said it would take about an hour and a half, and they said it'd be fine, and jumped in the back seat and drove down Fifth Street. Mm, but what time was that? Well, I'd been to a show. It was about 
About 10 minutes. Yeah, you know, it just doesn't seem right not to have Paul Frank around no more. Uh, oh, I'd like to lay my well, hands on Just a moment. Do, uh, do either of you know if McCrary carried much money around with him? Well, I... Oh, I don't think so. None of us carry much more, you know, and just enough to make changes in state these times. You never know. I never carry anything but a few tools out of my front seat. Frank used to carry a lap robe in his. I, I never do that. You know, I oh, remember one minute, time... Just a minute. You say you carried a lap robe? Yeah. I remember. It was a bright colored one. Blue and red check. Well, that may help. Now, look, Matt, do you think you could tell them if you saw them again? Oh, sure, I could tell them in a minute. I've got to get members of faces. They were young, and both of them were dark. The older one, the one who did all the talking, had sharp features, and the young one had flat features. He was shorter. Mm-hmm. Remember anything else? Hey, listen, did the one who did the talking have a low voice, Matt? Low yeah, voice? that's right. He had a deep, deep voice. They must be the same ones. I remember the boy. Say, did they get you? Get out with you two? Yeah, only I got suspicious and turned around when I was out in National City. Gee. Yeah, and supposing I hadn't turned around, maybe McCrary would be talking to you, and I'd be laying out there with a hole in my head. A short time later, Myers and Kelly, who were heading east on the road where McCrary was found, called their office in San Diego. Learn what has been discovered there. Learn that the two men they are following are soldiers. One with an exceptionally low-pitched voice, that they are traveling in a dodge shooting car, Turn to the brightly colored lap robe. The big clues they continue along the road takes to the suspect, which leads to Imperial Valley. Pick up more bits of information. The foreman of a railroad construction gang reports that he has seen a dodge shooting car parked on the side of the road with two soldiers working on the motor. The men rush to the spot. Find nothing but a few footprints and an oily rag. Realizing, however, that they're on the right track and that the men have lost time, they speed to El Centro. Go to the sheriff of Imperial County, James Applefield, to request his cooperation. Sheriff, we followed these men from San Diego. We're sure we were on the right track. In fact, we found traces of them just a few miles outside of El Centro. But we're going to have to have help now. You see, there are so many places they might go from here that, well, it would be next to impossible for two men to accomplish anything. We know we're close to them because they had engine trouble. We've got to have help now. Well, I'll be glad to do all I can, boys. Now, if the men you're trailing are the murderers, they'll undoubtedly head for the Mexican border. Are you sure they're in uniform? Well, they've been identified as soldiers by everyone we've talked to. Well, in that case, they'll have a hard time getting into Arizona. Now, I think the logical place to look for them is along the border. I'll call Calexico and have the officers from there make all the border points. Sheriff, Mr. Bryce outside and wants to see you. All right, send them in. Yes, sir. Now, I'll get that call in. Uh... Can you think of any additional dope on those men? No, I think you have it all. Okay, I'll pass it along. Yes, sir. And get me the collector dope, please. Yes, sir. Oh, hello, Bright. I'll be right with you. Oh, there's no hurry. Collector dope, please. Johnson speaking. Hello, Johnson. Apple still speaking. Oh, hello, sir. Something I can do? Yes. Uh, I'd like to have you cover the border roads for me and help me pick up some men, Johnson. Now, here's a description. There are two of them, both in Army uniforms, 157th Infantry. Both dark. One has a very low-pitched voice. Huh? Yes, yes, that's right, a low-pitched voice. Yeah, both young. They're driving a Dodge Touring car. And that's all we have on them. Well, keep our eyes open, sir. All right, we'd like to get them. They're killers. Now, let me know as soon as anything develops. What's all this about, Sheriff, these men in the Dodge? Uh, a couple of men who committed a murder in San Diego are in this vicinity. Did you say they were in a Dodge Touring car? Yeah, that's right. Why? Because I passed a car like that on my way into town just a few minutes ago, parked on the side of the road. Following up this bit of unexpected information, Captain Myers and Detective Kelly, led by Bright, are soon examining the car, which is a ruin. A brightly colored lap robe positively identifies it as belonging to McCrary. The spot where it is found is only a few hundred yards from the international border, which is unguarded at this point. But one conclusion is left. The fugitives have crossed the border into the Republic of Mexico. After a short conference, Myers and Kelly decide to continue after them personally. Hurried plans are made, and Deputy Sheriff Henry Gonzalez, well known along the border, is summoned. Gonzalez, you probably know better than we do what we're going to get into down there. From now on, everything depends on luck. We may get help from the officials, and we may not. No matter what happens, we're going to do everything we can to get those men. See, see I will do everything I can to help. So, early 
on the morning of January 11th, 1918, the three men crossed the border, speed along the nearly impassable Mexican road. Suddenly, with no warning, their car comes to a shuddering halt, refuses to start again. Surrounded by an inquisitive group of natives, Myers at the wheel listens to the discouraging sound of a laboring start. Looks like we're through with the car. Sure it is. I'll try it once more. Yeah, go ahead. Give it to me. Ah, she's all through, I guess. Well, cool and Gonzalez, see if anyone in this crowd has horses that we can buy. See, I try. Yeah, they were dead. There's no car in the world that could stand up on these roads. Yeah, yeah. fine country. Yeah, just the place I've been looking for to spend my vacation, I don't think. Senor de Mai. Yeah, what luck? Uh, Senor, uh, this man, he has horses. He always goes to American people, the friends run. To American? Good. Get him to stay here and ask him where we can get a hold of the police. <laughs> by a group of Mexican police are within two miles of the land where the fugitives have been seen. Hey, you know, you know, this ride can end any time as far as I'm concerned. Boy, I might say that I'm just a little bit sore. No, I guess we aren't the men we used to be. I'm beginning to feel it, too. Yeah. Hey, look at Gonzalez, you know. He's like a... Like a sack in that saddle. You know, that guy was probably born on a horse. Yeah. Hey, look. They're all stopping. What do you suppose is up? Catch me. Hey, Gonzalez. What's yeah. the idea? Tell them to keep going. Well, one minute, senor. I find out why they are stopped. Walk in the barber. I'm a famous man, senor. I'll rent your old pony. It's going to be a in your mano. They, uh, they say they will go no farther. They say this ranch belongs to one of the men's brothers. He will not go to it. You tell him we don't want the brother. Tell him we want the men that are there. Sure. I already tell him that. He said the men are friends. They say they will not go. Well, we'll go alone then. Find out how to get there. They will not tell me, senor. They say we cannot go. He will be mad. I think it is better we do not go. Oh, I'm not going to give up when I'm this close. You tell him to go back. We'll find the place. I think it is better we do not go, senor. It is better we keep Balked at every turn, Myers and Kelly once again find themselves left with no choice but to return to Mexicali. But arriving there, they find news. The foreman, who earlier had tipped Gonzalez off as to the whereabouts of the suspect, claims that less than an hour after Myers and Kelly had left for the ranch, the two soldiers had appeared in Mexicali. But they apparently had discovered the fact that they were being followed and had left immediately. Realizing this makes matters even worse than before, the two detectives first checked with the Mexican military commander of the district of Baja California, Governor Esteban Cantu, who promises to have all his posts keep a lookout for the criminals. Then called San Diego to inform Chief Hayes of their progress. And here they receive their second piece of news within the day when Chief Hayes orders them back to San Diego. As he has uncovered new evidence as to the identity of the wanted men. Accordingly, Myers and Kelly make the drive back to San Diego. Find that from a list of army deserters, two men and pictures of two more men answering the description of the murderers are being held for identification. The first two are released after being faced by Metz and Register, the cab driver. But when they are shown the pictures of the other two... These are the two. These are the ones who took the ride with me. They're the same ones, only I got suspicions and I came back. I remember this one. He's the one that told me to go down that street. He's the one that had the low voice. And he's the one that asked me all about the gear shift. I thought it was funny at the time, too. Are they the ones who killed McClary? Where are they, if I could just lay now, my wait hand? wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's have a look at uh, These are the ones, all right. Remember I told you one had sharp features? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is him. He's the one that had the deep voice. This other one has flat features, just like I said. They're the ones that drove away with McClary that night, and I'm sure of it. Fine. Well, that's about all you can do for us now. We want to get in touch with you later, so don't leave town unless you let us know. We'll call on you when we need you. Goodbye. So long. I told you I had to oh, write the right time on that. I told you. Now, Kelly, you go out to Camp County. Gather every single article you can find that belonged to either of these men and bring them in. Right. We've got a little more to work with now. Check up on the Army records, too. <laughs> Three hours later, the officer returned. Well, how 
to go, Tony. Oh, uh, not so hot. They made a good job of it. They destroyed every bit of writing they had except these three cards. Wait a minute till I find them. Here they are. They're so dirty you can hardly read them. What are their names? Uh, William B. Grissom and Horace St. John Clark. St. John, huh? That's a good one. Yeah. Clark enlisted at Parkdale, Colorado, and Grissom at Denver. Let me see those cards. Can you make anything out of them? Yeah, I made a name out of one of them, but you better check it and see yeah, that one. Right. Gladys. Gladys Galbraith. I think that's it. Well, here's an address. 1900. 1900 Stout. 1900. Hey, what's this? Parkdale, Car 40. Parkdale, Car... I've heard that before. Oh, boy, it doesn't mean a thing to me. Wait a minute, I've got it. I remember it's a car line in Denver. Hey, That's I, it. I didn't know that you ever been to Denver. Sure, I lived there for about three months. That's what it is, I'm sure of it. This must be an address there, too. Well, sure it is. I remember South Street now. Get me a clerk. I'll get a letter off the police in Denver and have them get a hold of this, Gladys Galbraith. <laughs> receipt of the letter, go to work at once. Detectives George E. and Henry J. Genty are sent to the address. And an hour later, they have Gladys Galbraith in their office or questioning her. Oh, uh, Gladys, do you know two soldiers named Grissom and Clark? Yeah, I know Bill Grissom. Why? You heard from him lately? No, I'm married now, and I don't want to have anything to do with him. I don't want to be bothered about him. Well, uh, where is he now, do you know? No, I don't know where he is, and what's more, I wouldn't tell you if I did. What do you think of that? Well, if you don't know where he is, you can't help it. That's right. Can I go now? Sure, you can go. Thanks. What's the idea, Ede? She knows more than she's telling. I know that. We're going to keep our eyes on her and watch her mail. She thinks we're through with her. She'll be natural. You know, she'll keep on doing the things she usually does. Oh, I get it, and I'm just the boy to do it. So long. Two days passed and nothing developed. But on the third day, Jenny intercepts a letter addressed to Gladys Galbraith. And after one glance at the signature, he bursts in on Eve. It's a letter from Grissom. Good. Let's have it. Hmm. Don't tell anyone I am here. My life wouldn't be worth a dime if you did. I am working at the John Smith Ranch, 12 miles from Fountain. Listen to this. Come to Fountain on Tuesday. We'll meet you there, and we'll have the ranch payroll. We'll go to Mexico. I'll meet you at the corner of 3rd and Mill Street. Uh, well, Gentry, something tells me you and I are due for a little trip to the corner of 3rd and Mill Street and Fountain. <laughs>
May 16, 1918, Grissom was found guilty by the General Court Martial Board of Camp Kearney of murder, theft, and desertion. Thank you. 